Hi, ladies and gentlemen, students and teachers and fans of the American Constitution and American politics. Uh, welcome to the Constitution of American Life uh, Off the Cuff with Four Bs. Uh, it's uh, great to hopefully have a conversation that uh, will inspire some of your own uh, insights uh, into our daily uh, constitutional political life. Uh, this session, um, we want to talk about uh, the third branch, Article 3, but more importantly, we want to kind of narrow down uh, on uh, the controversies involving interpreting uh, the Constitution. And uh, I think it would be safe to say that, uh, um, that since day one, uh, or at least, I don't know, whatever day it was, since Marbury, there have been uh, continuous controversies. Uh, uh, which have a lot to do with just the very nature uh, of Article 3. Uh, but we find this to be extremely topical. One, uh, I think we are seeing the consequences of the court's decision uh, in Heller versus U.S. and Chicago versus McDonald, two cases dealing with the Second Amendment, which I believe will, will be hotly debated for decades uh, to come. And also the court just recently agreed to hear a Mississippi uh, 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 law on uh, reproductive freedom or abortion uh, that the state legislature passed. They're going to hear that next session, um, and uh, that's going to bring to the forefront the interpretive approach that courts take uh, here. And I think one of the things we'll try to touch on is, you know, to what extent does politics play in what is considered the apolitical branch uh, of government? Um, so today we want to explore some other, you know, some of the uh, more common controversies, and I'm sure that Mr. Kavanaugh, our, uh, our expert on case law, will maybe have some obscure cases uh, to bring uh, to our awareness. Uh, I did do some homework. I actually did it a couple days ago, uh, anticipating a, a different time and place for this session that you know, I don't know, got canceled because one of the four people here is concerned about coronavirus and, you know, got his kids, uh, you know, uh, inoculated or whatever it is. So anyway, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm losing focus here. Anyway, I did look at a couple of sources on the kind of what are considered the worst decisions in Supreme Court history. Uh, I looked at fine law and uh, then the American Bar Association uh, each of them had uh, uh, lists and commentary on that. Uh, and so I think most of these, uh, we uh, wouldn't be surprised, and some of you may not be uh, surprised there. Uh, Dred Scott kind of leads the way uh, there. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, Lochner uh, versus uh, New York. And, and I, I bring this up at this time because we may be referencing and talking about uh, some of these. And to give my uh, compatriots here, uh, you know, maybe some, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, time to uh, think about some of these cases. Bush versus Gore, um, Buck versus Bell, which uh, I, I, that kind of motivated me to do a little bit more reading on why it was considered, you know, uh, one of the worst decisions, which, you know, leads us, I think, to uh, maybe have to talk about what criteria we, do we use. The civil rights cases of 1883, Hammer versus Dagenhart, uh, Exxon Shipping Company was the one uh, on the on the list uh, from both sources that I really did not have a lot of background detail. Uh, Korematsu, it's interesting. One source uh, ranks it uh, uh, as one of the bad decisions. One uh, one source does not. Uh, Bowers versus uh, Hardwick, Kilo versus City of New York or, or New uh, ah. New Haven. Is it New Haven? No, is it New Haven, Connecticut? Yeah. All right. And uh, Citizens United. Uh, so those are kind of the top 12 based upon the sources I looked at. I'm sure you could have a nice uh, uh, dinner conversation on that list and move things uh, in and out. Uh, but uh, let's kind of start uh, with you, Mr. Kavanaugh. Um, and, and that is the criteria for evaluating a case as being a bad or good decision. I'm curious from, you know, from your perspective, is, is that very act a political process? That is, is judging Supreme Court cases, there is no objective criteria whatsoever that we can put together to make those judgments that in the end, uh, it comes down to whether or not you like the end results. And if you like the end results, it's a good decision. If you don't like the end results, it's a bad decision. So, um, I, I, 
I guess I would have to agree with that. I would go back to a, a scholar we've mentioned on this, this uh, in our discussions before that we're, I think most of us are familiar with is uh, Dr. Kermit Hall, uh, who, uh, you know, brilliant scholar in his own right and, and author um, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, but I always like what he said. He said, you know, if, as far as Supreme Court decisions, somebody's dump truck's getting unloaded. And as for a guy that was cerebral as Kermit was and, and thoughtful as he was with his word choice, I, that really struck me. It's like somebody's dump truck is getting unloaded. And I think, David, that's exactly what you just described. You know, um, it, well, I think one of my students one time at a hearing said there's no such thing as judicial, judicial activism. She said that's what the losers call it. Right. Um, right. So I think it depends on your perspective. Oliver Wendell Holmes, I think, said a best one. I think he said that the law is a mirror of the American people. So, you know, I think sometimes, it, most of the time, the court is behind society in terms of its, some of its thought process. But yeah, I think it is, I think it is the case that, um, you know, so much of it depends on if, if, which way your twig is bent and depends whether or not it's a good opinion or a bad opinion. But somebody's own so, truck is getting unloaded. Without getting into specifics right now, is it, is it your point of view that we, the four of us, or take you know, four much more educated uh, legal scholars couldn't come up with uh, uh, objective criteria to be able to assess the legitimacy and uh, uh, right and righteousness of a court decision? Well, I think so. I do, I do think so, because I think that, you know, if the court opinion, whether it's written by a, a lower court or the Supreme Court, if it's grounded in the law, right, if it's anchored to the law, um, and sometimes we all know it's depending on personal interpretation, but if it's grounded in the law, I think it more than likely, even if you don't like it, it's probably going to be a legitimate opinion. A case uh, just, oh my gosh, just uh, in your guys' backyard, uh, the end of California assault weapons ban, just in, in the last couple of days, I was just reading about the uh, judge's opinion and oh my goodness, uh, this guy has, uh, I don't know if you've read anything about this, that, oh. <laughs> well, you know, he yeah. said that basically he said in his opinion that more people were killed um, by inoculated by the coronavirus vaccines than in mass shootings in America in the last, so in the last whatever. And I think there have been three perhaps uh, deaths related to the vaccine, perhaps even, they're not even sure about that. So that opinion, when you look at other things that he had said uh, in his written opinion, um, you got to wonder about that. That's a that's a you that that's not grounded in the law. This is grounded in the judges uh, making up his own information. Yeah, I'll, def I I'll defer to to the guy with the, the law degree on the panel or the history professor here. Well, and again, I, I, yeah, I've read a lot about it. I, I obviously, I mean, he. You know, uh, he made some comparisons or analogies that were pretty weak. I mean, the, the one that's getting all the press is that an AR or an a, you know, AR-15 is equivalent to a Swiss Army knife. That's gotten all the press. I don't know if we assess the the legitimacy, the constitutional legitimacy of a decision based upon you know uh, 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 one or two lines there. Uh, uh, so. I, I found it very interesting to to kind of evaluate the criticism of, of that uh, decision. Uh, and I think it reinforces that it's predominantly coming from uh, those who want greater regulations on uh, on arms in society and uh, or in a, we might well, no, David, I disagree with that because you know I, I, I could accept an opinion that was grounded in the Second Amendment and the law, but it's not just one or two lines. If you read through this guy's opinion, you know, uh, home invasions and rapes, uh, the coronavirus, the Swiss Army knife, the militias, the idea that, you know, these things are happening. So this opinion was riddled with more than one or two lines. So, so and yes, what I like to have, you know, what I, I like the idea with California's ban doesn't affect me any right now. But the idea is that, that opinion is not grounded in the law. That, and I think that's what makes a, a, a more legitimate opinion. But again, I will defer to Mike and Tim. Okay. All right. Uh, Mike, Tim, any comment on anything that Chris and I have been chatting about here for a few minutes? Yeah, I got a couple. Um, 
the uh, I, I, I'm struck by uh, the, your list that in some ways, every one of those quote bad decisions, I would suspect the criteria to determine that they're bad decisions may have some kind of moral component to it. Now, whether those moral components are um, weak constitutional moral argumentation or whether they're uh, non-constitutional moral uh, objections, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, but but it, that kind of struck me as you were going through the, uh, the, the greatest um, bad decisions. Uh, I would suspect there's some kind of moral argumentation, especially like Plessy, uh, Buck B. Bell, um, uh, Dred Scott. Uh, so so that, that's interesting to me. Um, and, and, I, and as I think we would all agree here in this uh, circle, sometimes to sort out the, uh, sometimes there's not a bright line in elite, well, maybe I'll just speak for myself. I don't know that there's a bright line distinction between constitutional moral arguments and non-constitutional moral arguments. I mean, honestly, a lot of times precedent and, and, and arguments rooted in law, I mean, they're fig leaves. Uh, <laughs> and the other, my other thought is that, um, sorry to do this, but going back to the anti-federalist writer Brutus, he, uh, in Brutus 12, 13, 14, 15, he saw this and he saw it coming out of this um, squishy term in Article Three, equity. He made the, article, uh, the argument that, um, that the court could hear these equity type cases and he was fearful that the, in, in British history, equity courts, uh, like if there wasn't anything in the common law to guide British justices, they would uh, put on their equity hat and they would just kind of make it up. Um, and so Brutus, I think, uh, I, I think very prescient to note that um, the squishiness of the equity clause in the constitution, and he speculates these, these justices are going to be beyond, I mean, they, they would see themselves, at, not even heaven could control their decision-making through this uh, equity uh, clause in the constitution. So, so, so two thoughts. I think Brutus saw this problem very early and he saw it in the equity phrase. And um, I, I wonder about the moral component in some of these. Well, I just real quickly, Professor Moore, isn't at its very core, isn't all law moral? An um, expression of some well, kind of sure. moral? Okay. Sure, but if but if uh, I think most Americans are more comfortable with uh, the morality of constitutional arguments being rooted in constitutional morals, um, because you always run run into the problem of um, you know if you're going to use religion, um, you know which religion. I mean, we've got that First Amendment problem there. So 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 yeah, it's all morals, but is the basis of the morals is in a text called the constitution or is it extra constitutional argument? Well, let me, I guess, you know, when you say, you know, moral within, you know, I guess within the, of the constitution and then there's this outside the constitution morality, isn't all constitutional morality about power? I mean, in the end, it's about power and the abuse of power. So, uh, you know, uh, even if you talk about the first amendment religious clause or whatever, it's still about power. And you know who's going to make the decision right. about s certain things? I just I, I guess. Uh, right well, there. I mean that uh, that ought to go to Mike. Uh, I, I think based on all, all our conversations in the last year, where uh, he, I mean, obviously Mike sees things in terms of power. But I mean, let's think about Plessy in terms of morality. Um, you know, there's 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 the argument that Plessy's, I guess, a, a horrible decision because um, um, eventually Brown said it was. Um, now there are people at the time that didn't didn't see it as a, as a great uh, great decision either. But I, I'm not sure um, that's an immoral uh, that the logic of segregation is on its face immoral. It's not preferable, uh, and it's certainly uh, one particular perspective on the equal protection clause at that time. But um, so to to say, I think to say that Plessy is immoral constitutionally, I think that's arguable to say it's immoral uh, beyond the constitution. I think that's actually a better argument that it, it treats people uh, 
as inferiors. And I think um, there's a lot of sacred texts out there that believe in the inherent quality of people. You know, I had a gut feeling that uh, trying to restrain this uh, topic conversation to one hour was going to be very difficult. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole there on Plessy and morality because uh, we could really get into the darkness. So I'm going to defer to uh, okay. Professor Williams for thoughts, comments on anything that's been said so far. Yeah, I, have, I think I have two general comments just to piggyback on what Tim said and then what Chris said earlier about the mirror idea. Um, I mean, we've, we've all been involved in conversations where people have made the argument that actually Dred Scott was um, legally, at least most of it, until he went off on topics he didn't need to talk about, was rightfully decided at the time in terms of reading the Constitution and what's there. Um, I'm not saying that's what we should all believe, but I think that argument's there. And the same thing with Brown. Um, we've had discussions in this group about how Brown got to the right result. Um, but as a legal decision, it was probably not the court's best work. And we're probably, you know, there's more and more written now about the implications of that, right? So I think there's a, there's the, there's the where you want to get to, and then there's the process of getting there. And my other comment related to that is that, you know, there's been these debates within the legal community and political scientists for a long time about whether judges and justices could be these completely objective referees, right? Like that they were just sort of like robots that could do their interpretation and leave out all their attitudes and experiences. And, you know, there's actually been a lot of research on this by political scientists and legal scholars who say, no, actually there's evidence that judges and justices are going to rule in a way that reflect their own experiences, their own backgrounds, their own preferences, and we should expect that. We're human beings interpreting words. But to me, what that signals then is that we need to be really sure that the court represents the differing in opinions and differing perspectives that are out there. So when we, when we talk about interpreting the constitution in courts, I think we have to have a conversation about, okay, who is on courts? How do they get there? How long do they stay? Should we be doing a better job at making sure that these these diverse opinions that we know are going to exist when you interpret any sort of written text, that you have the most vibrant, honest discussion as you can instead of having it being made by maybe folks who, who are going to see the world in one way and not see the world in others. What was uh, John Roberts' statement? Uh, he tried to be real clinical and he said, we're just umpires calling balls and strikes. Yeah. Uh, I think that may get to your point, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'd say to Roberts, he needs to watch a few baseball games to see how flexible the, <laughs> the strike zone is from judge, judge well, to know, judge. Well, and he said that, right? At the same time, he 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 has his decision in the Obamacare case where he, he kind of yeah. pulled this tax and spend out of the hat. And, and now the question is, that question is now coming right back to the court, right? Because the Republicans said, okay, we took that out of the law. What are we going to do now? And um, so we'll see how it easy is it is for him to keep his strike zone per se, right? On this kind of interpretation. There's two things there, um, the idea. Well, one, uh, uh, let me go back to Tim and uh, Plessy. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, and no, no, to actually to support you, because if you think about it in one way, this is the first time the court talked about equality of black folks. Yeah. They, I mean, so if you think, and, and I, I, I disagree with the outcome of the opinion, I think there's way more to it, but the court is actually considering the equality of black folks, right? So, I, but that is a stretch. I want to go on record now that we're being recorded. That is a s extreme stretch, okay? Um, and then uh, to the idea, I think John Roberts said that during his confirmation hearing, right? That he was about the balls and strikes. Um, but I, I'm really curious. I want to know the backstory because with his decision in the initial Obamacare case, right, uh, that the the feeling is that he switched his his viewpoint at the towards the end of their discussion towards towards the end of conferences, and he actually was worried more about the political nature of the court and how the court would have been how the Roberts Court will be remembered. Because if it's just another organ of the Republican Party, uh, going back to Bush v. Gore, you know, that's a pure curium opinion that changed the outcome of our history. Um, and Sandra Day O'Connor, you know, has regretted that decision. 
so I think he was concerned about the political nature of the court and how it's viewed. And maybe I would like to know the, you know, inside baseball uh, on that one to see if he really did switch his opinion at the last minute. Professor Williams, since you're the only trained lawyer amongst the group, uh, I use that word loosely at these, uh, <laughs> these days, but you did go to law school. I'm wondering if you could kind of give us, what would your criteria be? All right, so be that classroom professor and you're asking students to do an evaluation. Uh, what would your evalu evaluatory uh, tool be? Uh, rubric, rubric. Uh, rubric. <laughs> Uh, on, on assessing, uh, you know, decisions as constitutionally legitimate good, constitutionally illegitimate bad? What criteria would you use? Well, um, and I haven't thought about this in a long time since I was legally trained, but um, I'll give it a thought. I, I, I mean, the, the, the first step is, is to read the words and to try to make a quote unquote reasonable understanding of what those words, I think, mean, right? And there you have to do a little bit of history. You have to, you have to pay homage to what they maybe meant at the time and what they mean now. Um, so I think that's the first thing is just looking at the words and making sure that you understand what they're saying reasonably. Um, and then you're looking at, you know, I think intent. I think, I think judges looking for the intent of lawmakers is, um, a fair way to interpret, to look at the debates, to look at what was said during debates, what, what they intended, what they intended the words to mean at that time. Um, and I think also that um, courts also have to then take into account um, what they have said before about those words and about that intent. Um, um, stare decisis is an extremely important um, idea in the common law and it's, a, it's an idea for us to keep um, the law to remain consistent. And then I think finally, it's like, what is the what is the impact? And maybe that's getting to a little bit of what Tim was just talking about, about equity. Um, I don't think judges sh should think that they have to make decisions with complete blinders on, like not taking into account what the implications are gonna be for the way people live their daily lives. I mean, at the end of this, we're talking about people living daily lives and making choices and how the law is gonna um, impinge that in some way. So I think all those factors are ones I would say are important. Hey, well, so let me, can I ask Mike a quick question? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was listening to your, I, I, I absolutely agree with the stuff you just said in terms of, you know, how to view it. How much would you, would you include deference in there? The idea that the judicial branch deferring to the legislative branch or deferring to the executive branch and not wanting to interject itself into what they may see as their role. Is, that, is there a role for, do you think, for opinions and that idea of deference? Yes. Yeah. And I, that should be on the list for sure. I mean, I, it's, it's tricky though, right? Because courts... Um, Very tricky. They, they can't say that they're going to be a fourth branch, right? They can't say that they're going to, like, in terms of writing laws. But every time they put pen to paper and they say, this is unconstitutional because they are engaging in that debate because they're sending signals to lawmakers about what they could do to make the law uh, constitutional. So it's one of those, um, I don't know, it's a little smoke and mirrors to me because it's a little bit of wink, wink, nod, nod. Please take a look, look at our footnotes because that's where you're really going to find out what the roadmap is. At the same time, the court cannot be at all like play that up in terms of that they're actually making laws. You know, on, on the four criteria, I, I, again, I, I think they're generally clear. Uh, precedent is the one that, I, that to me is the most clarity. Although, again, as you point out, there's there still can be a fuzziness uh, with uh, you know uh, uh, with stare decisis and precedent. Just some things that you know that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, Mike. And uh, you know, see when we when we talk about Plessy, that's where I think the court kind of in that literal method. I mean, what do the words, no state shall deny any person within their jurisdiction, equal protection of the laws, all right? I don't know how you square that circle in Plessy with that method uh, uh, there. And that's why I, I, I would disagree to some extent with Professor Moore and Kavanaugh on Plessy uh, that, yeah, you know, you know, now if you get into intent of some people, yeah, then Plessy is, you know, 
probably right on. That is, I think it's safe to say that a, a majority of Americans, as they contemplated the idea of equality, it did not mean this, you know, this absolute sense of integrated equality of the races uh, in 1896. Uh, and therefore lies some of our dilemma on this criteria is because they can be antagonistic uh, towards each other. I guess my question, you know, you know, that's kind of my comment. And when we get to intent, the intent of who is to me the dilemma. I mean, we've, we've talked right. about this before. If we're looking at the original Constitution and everybody, I mean, there are those who love to talk about the original intent. Well, and I'm sure you guys have all had this discussion with your students okay, is it the 55 or so who are at Philadelphia? You know, is that the intent? Or is it just the guys who wrote the, the Federalist Papers? Is that, I mean, you guys know that, that whole dialogue there about intent. My question to you, Mike, is you, you used impact. Can judges have any clue? I mean, can they have any realistic clue about the, the intended or unintended consequences of their decision? I mean, I think about Brown. I mean, Brown is, again, hailed and worshipped, but I'm pretty sure the court did not quite realize, all right, what, you know, what would happen and what did happen. All well, right? Frank, Frankfurter was nervous. Frankfurter was very nervous about. Well, uh, I think they anticipated the resistance, Tim. I don't think yeah. I'm looking at longer term. I don't think they anticipated right. the massive destruction of black education or black educators. Because oh, yeah. in integrated schools, who were the first to go? As black educators at the black schools, you know, uh, were the first to go. And you kind of destroyed this, this middle class element there. I don't know if they could anticipate that. Oh, you see, I, I thought you were leading to a different way for what the court did know. So this is the way I would see that. I think you're right with what you I'm left-handed, you know, it's called a, it's called a curveball. <laughs> it's called a curveball. I, I you a curveball. Yeah. I like I like it because I'm a right-hander, and that's going to come right into my wheelhouse, man. It's going to go uh -huh. right. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, Especially I, if it's an EFIS pitch. <laughs> <laughs> when I think of impact, it makes me think of like, okay, um, what is the evidence out there? Like, is there a similar s policy that we can see? Okay, this is what happened when X or Y happened, right? Let's see what the cause and effect is. I see the court sitting there in Brown and saying, okay, we've had, we have this social scientific evidence about what has happened to young black children being in this environment. And if we do nothing to stop it, that is going to continue. That needs to stop. Like the self-esteem of young black children needs to be um, connected to their own culture rather than to wanting to be more white, right? I think that's where the court was focusing on the impact. I think they didn't have the information for the other impact. And like today you say, well, the court, when the court decides these courses, these cases on abortion, do they have evidence to see what happens when their states do not allow abortion, basically effectively say no abortions after six weeks? We have the evidence to know what's going to happen in terms of the past, right? And I think that, yeah, I do think that courts, there's, a, there's room for that in the court's sort of decision. Well, there's that's, the legal, go ahead. But that's Tim. probably why Lochner is such a bad decision because, uh, I mean, when the court says uh, New York can't uh, regulate hours, the impact is uh, it advantages employers and it shafts uh, immigrant, uh, immigrant workers trying to make a living and, and just survive. So I think Lochner may be one of those classic examples where they didn't think through the impact of, you know, looking at the 14th Amendment the way they did in that case. Well, so think one of the, uh, Dave, I'm sorry, just one more thing about Brown. Is and just a side note, and I think Dave, your point is absolutely spot on in terms of not anticipating that yeah. type of outcome. I don't think they anticipated that, but also remember the time frame for anybody watching this. It was the Cold War, and you know we're you know the idea that the pressure on the court to be unanimous and on Warren to make it unanimous, and the steps he went to, like steps to the hospital, the, to get a justice to be able to you know get on board with this. So I think that we, we, it didn't happen in a vacuum, right? The, the events of the day, especially the Cold War, as we saw that being played out, we are you know, opposed to the godless communists, we're all that in a bag of chips, but we treat a big part of our population like second-class citizens. How can you say that the Democrat democracy in America is better than communism? So 
I think there's a there's uh, that aspect of Brown as well. Well, I guess, I guess you know, in this whole discussion, especially with you and Mike in these last few minutes, it seems to me that you guys see the court playing a public policy role. I mean, the the, the issues we're looking at, that you know, should they even consider? I mean, I guess I, you know, here's the question: should they even consider impact? Because the impact is more about, you know, to me, the policy side of law. Their job is to interpret either the Constitution or statutes. All right. It's not their job to worry about, you know, the policy outcomes. That's, well, Steve, that's, that's, David, I, that's, that's, where, the, that's where I disagree with you, because Tim already explained to us equity. Right. And this is the idea of equity is what made you know, like Brutus and other you know, founders nervous because that had been handled by chancellors in Great Britain and handled by royal governors and their courts. So the idea that you're creating a Supreme Court that also is gonna deal in issues of equity and fairness, right? Or maybe we might call it a substantive due process. Exactly, and that, and that really makes people nervous because that's you know, often not grounded in, the, in, uh, in law, uh, right. real well at least. And but now we're back to Brown, right? Yeah. I mean, where does, it, where does the Supreme Court get no, the ability to go tell the people of Topeka, Kansas, oh, you must integrate. Then we go back to Mike's point about fairness, and we think about the Clark Dahl study. We think about the idea that uh, what the idea of living in a society uh, for young black children at that time, and even maybe to this day and age, what society should, tells them that their, their reflection. But see, the, and there is my problem, and I think that's there's where the court gets into trouble, Chris, and there's why the faith right. in the court has diminished greatly. Um, it's not the court's job, all right, to, to get into sociology, all right, of the social psychological impact of segregation on young black uh, uh, youth. That's, it's, not the, it's the legislature's job to think about those policy implications, their job. And, and that's why I think Brown is such a horrible decision. Because they, they went off into this law law land of social psychology. They could have had the same results just by sticking with the literal understanding of equal protection of the law. And therefore, well, they wouldn't have been accused of, of making things up and legislating from the bench if they had just said, hey, here's what everybody understands what that means. Tim? Well, but they did uh, the same failure in Gobitis. I mean, uh, the year after Gobitis, Adventist kids were getting beat up all over America. Um, you know, and so, I mean, I agree with you. Um, I think I fundamentally agree with you. It, it's a real squishy thing. <laughs> squishy, there that is again. It's real uh, troublesome to, to think about all the ramifications, because I doubt any of the judges on the court when they issued Gobitis said, yeah, we're quite fine with Gobitis. Uh, with Adventist kids getting, uh, uh, not Adventist, but um, Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, yeah, getting beat up. And so they, they get a, a, a moment of moral clarity a year and a half later, uh, having the sociological information uh, in, in Barnett. So, I mean, they, there's, yeah, the, it's hard. And I, I would not want to be a judge to think through about all the what ifs uh, that occur. I mean, it can't. I, it can't be the it can't be the leading factor, but I I just want to understand your argument because David, would you admit that when a court makes any decision, they realize it's going to have a public policy effect, and they probably have an I they have an inference of how it's going to affect public policy, right? Like they know that as human beings, they might have you know some idea, but that gets back to my question. I don't know if they can anticipate. Well, all right. Well, the what, impact of their decisions, uh, you know, in any kind of accuracy that we're comfortable with. I guess in terms of just as a, as a rubric of interpretation, then, I guess for me, once you take the step and say, all right, these are not sequestered Americans. These are Americans living in society, reading the newspaper, going out. They realize the public policy decision of X case. What I hear you saying is, is that they should then consciously try to block that out. And what I'm saying is they can't ever consciously block it out. So why don't they at least, I don't know, be in tune with it. And it, it, it can't be the leading reason, but I think that it, it, it can be a part of their overall analysis in terms of at the margins, knowing this, we should factor that in is what I'm saying. 
And I think that on some of the cases that we've talked about, the problem is that it is, it does seem to be the leading factor, well, whether it's Brown, uh, you well, know. But some, and, but some of the cases come to the court as a sociological case. I like think of all the affirmative action cases that they've had to decide over the years. Well, that's a straight up policy case. And, and they're, they're trying to weed through all the policy ramifications of, uh, of post Baki uh, to, to do that. So, I mean, some of them come, I guess my point is some of them come to the court as a policy case with so, a little bit so, of constitutional language attached to it. <laughs> so David, based on your argument, would you say that Roe's not justiciable? Was Roe not a justiciable case then? No, I think, you know, again, I think we, we stay away to some degree from, you know, and, and, and there's a dilemma in Roe there. Uh, but the, the fundamental question was, OK, does the right to privacy in Griswold now extend to a woman and her body and her relationship with their doctor in the area of reproduction? That was the constitutional question. All right. And the constitutional answer should have been through the Ninth Amendment and unenumerated rights. Uh, we acknowledge that there is a fundamental right to privacy that we previously, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if established uh, in Griswold. Uh, and, and we also now believe that that is a fundamental right. And then they kind of let the legislatures play around with that. Uh, well, then based, now, again, on, based on that, then, and Brown, I can say, well, the court also grounded their decision in the idea of equal protection of the laws, and they were able to show how what was the, the current system was not granting equal protection of the laws to a certain segment of the society. So therefore, that case was justiciable as well. So, I mean, yeah, did they, did they were, was there evidence introduced of a, a sociological nature? Absolutely. As evidence in Roe was introduced in, as a, in a psychological nature. So I, I just, so I don't know. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think there's a very fine line uh, here. I just look, when we talk about controversies in interpreting the Constitution, and in the last analysis, the only power that the court has is the faith that people put in that institution. They have the power of the word. They neither have an army nor do they have a bank uh, that would allow them to have some muscle. All right. The only thing they have is their word and their word word has to be as far above reproach as they can make it. And so they've got to try to stay away as much as prop, as possible from those areas of policy, you know, which, which could be construed as policymaking. Uh, it's probably impossible in some cases to stay away from it completely. I, I would agree. But in Brown, Chris, they went through the back door to get to the Equal Protection Clause. They didn't go straight. All right. If you, and again, it's a beautiful decision. One, it's short and it's easy to read there. But, you know, you've read it. They go through the back door to get to the 14th Amendment when they should have gone through the front door. But, but they got into this sociological notion. And some people are going, wait a minute. You know, it's not, is the court made up of social psychologists. Is that what they're there to do? No, they're there to interpret, in this case, the 14th Amendment. Now, and I, again, they get to the same result. You know, uh, they get to the same result if they just go through one of Mike's criteria, and that's the literal uh, uh, interpretation of the 14th Amendment. And we could even talk a little bit about intent, at least of the primary authors but, uh, there. But wasn't, okay, so we, you brought up Plessy before, and you focused on how is it confusing Congress shall make no law. To, to me, the key phrase there, obviously, is equal protection. And I think the, the court said, well, look, we have similar pe people that they're, they're on, they're on a, a train, and as long as they're in similar train compartments, what's the big deal? If it's equal protection to put them in equal, equal train compartments, but they're just not going to be together. That's a reading of equal protection. And to me, what the, the Clark Dahl experiment does is it blows that up. It says, no, there are implications for separating people, even, even if we assume that the uh, where we're separating are equal in terms of the quality, which we all know the train compartments and the schools were not. But even assuming that, it's having this negative impact on people's lives. To me, that gave the court the ability to look at equal protection differently and to say it's not, it's, it can't, it has to be more than having blacks and whites in equal situations differently because that's not good enough because of these impacts. 
And right. David and, also and, did, I'm going to jump in here because, and I, I should have said this earlier in terms of, and you had said this, and I don't disagree with you that shouldn't some of this fall on the legislatures, right? And absolutely, so much of this should fall on the legislatures. And I think that what we've seen is the inability of legislatures, either at state level or even the national level, to actually do their jobs, you know, which I'm not sure what that is, but the idea to, to make life better for people, to, you know, going back to Cicero to make the most people happy, so to speak. But I think what we end up with are lazy legislatures or legislatures that are so narrowly, state legislatures that are so narrowly focused because people were not allowed to participate in the democratic process. I mean, this is, I think King alluded to this in a letter from Birmingham jail. They talked about Alabama. You've got rule of law and rule by law. And what was happening in Alabama was rule by law because a lot of the folks were not in, incorporated into the process. So you have legislatures that are acting in, in ways that could be either lazy or detrimental to population. Therefore, the courts step in to sweep up behind the parade, so to speak. And, 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 and again, the answer, the solution to that, Professor Kavanaugh, is not to turn it over to the courts. I, I, the solution I is for the people to hold the... The, the solution is for the people to hold the legislature, legislature to the state net more accountable, all right, to do their job. And I well, think the, you, the, you well, no, 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 because no, 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 no. The people of Alabama were absolutely supporting what this, the legislature of Alabama was doing because they were the people that were voting for those people. There was a segment of society that did not get to participate in that. Therefore, is the innate unfairness of it. So the, the people were holding the Democrat. The, okay, the, so now, uh, yeah, you just lost me. You've moved on to the right to vote uh, there. Uh, uh, well, you, know, you uh, said hope for the people. Oh, inputs. The legislature account. Inputs. There, was, there wasn't adequate input. And, and understand in the court's decision, and, and, you know, again, controversial, most definitely in Baker versus Carr and Westbury versus Sanders in those ones. You know, again, they confronted, and like I said, to me, it was a no-brainer. The 15th Amendment made it fundamentally clear, combined with the 14th Amendment, that states cannot discriminate in the right to vote. Every vote has to count equally. You know, same thing talking about, plus, the, you know, Mike, all the court had to do in 1954 is go see Harlan. Here's Harlan's dissent in Plessy. There. There's our answer. All right. And Harlan makes a very literal, all right, argument in Plessy. Not a social science argument, but a very literal constitutional. In essence, almost in a, in a way Blackian in the sense of what part of equal protection do you people not understand? Now, I can't. I can't believe I'm going to say this, um, but let me get a pen. Uh, this idea of inputs was first, uh, well, at least in my uh, path of education, I guess, articulated by John Hart Ely. And he makes the argument that you don't, you know, uh, if we could only get away from our suspicions about the courts being policymakers, if we got it right on the front end. And this whole book, Democracy and Distrust, is about uh, getting to Mike's point and then uh, Chris's point too about inputs. That if, uh, and, and I can't help but think, uh, and I think he's a political scientist, that's why I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think that book is even more prescient now that this idea of inputs matter to get good policy so we don't get in this, uh, these suspicions and uh, second guessing the courts being too political. So, so I think uh, it's a hard book to read. It's not easy. But the, the gist of it is really well, uh, well thought through that front end inputs may have has a lot to do with um, what we see happening in court or what we don't like seeing happening in courts. So what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is you saying that Madison got it wrong, that we didn't expand the sphere and have a better influx of talent. Well, well I, th I think Ely does take him to task because, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's not convinced that the enlightened uh, statesman will always be at, or are at the helm <laughs> when he wrote the book. Yeah. Yeah, and so there, uh, there's a tip of the hat, Mike, to the political scientist community. With uh, oh yeah, thank you, Tim. I mean, we've we've grown a lot as a as a team. I think. In terms of how we <laughs> um, I'm gonna I gotta go shower after this. Yeah. I feel so dirty. I just I want to bring in a, a comparative point of view on this in the inputs because I th I think as as Americans we may are 
we are in this like false sort of sense of what we could ask judges to do. So here's what I want to say. South Africa's new constitution creates all these positive rights that we've talked about before in other sessions. And for example, one of the positive rights says everyone has the right to have access to ad adequate housing. Okay. Alarm bells go off for Americans. Court shouldn't get involved in this. The second line of the, of the phrase though says, the state must take reasonable legislative or other measures within its available resources to achieve the progressive realization of this right. And what the constitution is doing there is they're putting front and center, courts, you do have a role to play in policymaking, but you also have to show deference. Like you can't tell the elected officials how to spend their money, right? But you do need to keep into account that we should be pushing the legislative branch to live up to this right. I think other countries in the world have this notion that judges can do this and that the sky is not gonna fall. I think it's a, it's, it's a distinctly sort of American question about judges and how, how they can make these decisions without having their preferences. I think other countries just take it for what it is. Judges are gonna have preferences. The constitution is a set of preferences, right? <laughs> it's saying what we want to aspire to be. So let's all be on the same team and kind of work towards that in a way that's fair. So is part of the problem here, and I'm curious, Professor Williams, uh, is part of the problem is that we have a general belief that the court is the last line of defense of constitutional principles. And so that puts, because that's a cultural belief, it's really not, in my mind, a constitutional truism, but it is a cultural belief that the court understands the tremendous pressure on them to come up with answers and solutions to questions that I don't know if all, if all of these questions necessarily belong in courts. I, I wanna hear what uh, Professor Kavanaugh more said on this, but I would say yes. As we talked about, I think it was last week, my opinion is, is that our constitution is probably not detailed enough. And the whole question of judicial review, while we all can agree that probably it belongs in the executive branch, right? It's not clear. It, 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 it could be stated much more clearly about what the role of the court is vis-a-vis -vis these other branches. And what we've been doing for the last 240 years is really having this discussion about federalism and separation of powers and trying to read in these gray areas of which are not spelled out for reasons that we've all talked about. But I think that is part of the problem. I think, I think Justice Jackson said this. I, 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 I think I got the right guy. He said, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not last because we're infallible. We're infallible because we're last. Um, and you're right, David. And I think you're absolutely right in terms of assessing uh, what the cultural belief is that, that why the court is so important because they're the backstop, right? They're the backstop for all of this. When we know that the legislature can do things, we even know the executive can do things. We know state legislatures can do things and governors can do things to correct mistakes. But we, and this is why I think you've seen more people um, pay more attention to elections because they understand the appointment power to the Supreme Court is so important. Um, because the, the cultural belief is that that's, those are the people that go into the cave, they consult the skull and they come out and say, this is, we've consulted the skull and this is what the law is. And um, so I do believe that's the case. And though we know that, that there are ways that the court is not last. So unfortunately, I do believe people believe that. Mr. Moore. I, I think, uh, I think my colleagues have stated it well, I, I have nothing to add on that. Well, okay, so and David, David, you well know that I'm not a big, uh, I'm not a big, I don't turn court, cartwheels over the court. Uh, I have suspicions about their uh, uh, sagacity. Wait, no, and weren't, I, you, weren't you just quoting a, a political scientist? Come on now. Yeah, I, I was, I was, but that, okay. uh, you know, the, you know, consistency is the last refuge of a scoundrel. <laughs> well, and, you know, and I'll say this, Mr. Moore, uh, you know, I, I, you know, we've been friends for over 20 years uh, and nobody's had a more profound effect on my thinking about the court uh, than you have. And, and, and I imagine at least uh, because I've known Mike the longest here, 
uh, he's probably a little surprised, uh, but I've come to that, you know, one through our discussions, but uh, to also do a lot of reading. John Hart Eli was, was one of them. And yes, that's a really hard book to get through, to be quite honest. Uh, but, uh, you know, that my love back in the 80s and 90s of the court and, and just, you know, plotting and feeling warm and fuzzy about the Warren court and to a certain degree, the Burger court, uh, you know, you, you nailed it. Well, wait till the personalities change. Yeah, wait till I mean, the that's, ideology I mean, change, that's right? so Simons wrote a great book. Uh, of the court being the white horse comes in in uh, the, the history of the American court has been expanding liberty. And so uh, keeping the faith, I think was the name of the book. It's a great book, but the premise was that the court is this, uh, you know, the, the savior and expanding of liberty. Well, I, I mean, when I first read it, I thought, okay, yeah, that's a good book. What happens if, if the end of liberalism on the court occurs? And I think in the last uh, 20, 30 years, we've seen, uh that change and so uh so yeah i, th I think it is a, a little bit naive to assume that the court will always be expanding this liberty the way that the burger court and uh and to your point the the the, uh, 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 the warren court did i mean those I days think, are over i think the uh mississippi case that mike alluded to earlier i think or somebody did maybe david you did uh, yeah the, the court's been on the docket for his next term will be a great case to some, to kind of summarize all of what we've discussed this evening, because obviously the makeup of the court has changed. You have some people that are known for their more conservative, more religious backgrounds on the court now. Um, we have a sorry to see this of, well, I wouldn't say Roe as much anymore as I would say uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in the early 90s. That really yeah. is the case that most yeah. of the, that established kind of we've moved from privacy to liberty. Uh, is kind of one of the controlling ideas. But I think this Mississippi case um, will encompass a lot of those things to see if this is an expansion of liberty um, or continuing to expand that liberty. So that'll be a really anticipated oral argument as well, and obviously the opinion. Well, and uh, you know, a little side note there, and I, I think I'm coming up to the clock. My last visit to uh, the national finals uh, I was uh, hanging out with a former student at Tim's who works uh, for the legislative branch in DC and then uh, Professor Chambers who we're gonna see in our next session uh, there. And we had a little bet because uh, you know this, I think it was Kavanaugh uh, nomination and that process of time. And I said, within five years, Roe v. Wade will be overturned. And we're coming up and it's actually you know next spring uh, we're coming up to that point, and I can't wait to, because I think it's 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 you know it's it's a no-brainer that although they may not overturn Roe and Casey, they're going to gut it to such a degree that we'll go back uh, to pre-1973 uh, on that. So I just find that uh, interesting. I'm looking forward to talking to Professor Chambers. You know, one thing to to, to close on, I guess, as we come up against. Uh, our, our time frame today, and that is, you know, Tocqueville said in Democracy in America that it seems that every question in America becomes a legal question. Is that a byproduct of our culture at the founding, or is that the establishment of the Constitution? And I, I, yeah, I'm asking you a philosophical You want to question. ask that question with two yeah. minutes left? <laughs> yeah. I, I, well, there's, there's, you know, I got three minutes, uh, but uh, yeah, I just... <laughs> I mean, anyone in jump? I'm just wondering. Where Tocqueville that was kind from. of right. They're not political. They're they're not legal decisions. They're political decisions. That's what I would say. Every decision is a. And I know the semantics, potato potato. But I think there's a there's enough difference there. But yeah, I think he's kind of right. So, well, he again. He said, it, "What is it? Almost every question ends up in the courts, you know, in yep. America." And I'm I'm just curious, Tim. I'm being sincere. Is that an outgrowth of our political culture of the entire 18th century? Or is that something that started, was started in motion with state constitutions and the national constitution and their in, the institutions of the day? I'm just, I'm wondering what your, your brief uh, view of that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Okay. Well, I guess uh, the, yes. Yes and yes and no. Uh, I, I I can't even I can't even start, David. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, like I said, I I chuckled earlier today. <laughs> thinking, there is 
I, I got this list of questions and that was my, you know, one well, of mine. And, and I, it was like, there's no way we're going to get this done in an go, hour. Go ahead, Mike. Answer yeah, we, in one minute. Yeah, we talked about this last week about at the founding, there was this little bit of a debate between Jefferson and Madison about whether the Constitution should endure or whether they should be changed, right? And I, we all know Jefferson changed his mind <laughs> quite quickly on that. But the endurance, the, the fact of how we celebrate our Constitution and the National Archives, that it's, it's treated as this um, sacred text. Yeah. I, I do think there's something there that every time we have an important public policy decision, it can get rooted back to the Constitution and then it becomes a debate about who we are as a country and who we have been. And it, it can get very both legalistic and political and cultural at the same time. And I do think that this is something that's distinctive about the United States. There's not a, a lot of other countries that, that these debates turn into these moral, constitutional, cultural things like really, really quickly. And I do think it's because as a culture, we think our constitution is the best. We think it's endured. And we have this notion that if we change the constitution, the sky is going to fall. And um, so, yeah, I think it's part of it. Hey, Mike, just to note, that's a uh, hundred days till constitution day. <laughs> <laughs> and what a, what a great note to, uh, to close on uh, uh, my fellow Americans. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation. Uh, in our next session, we are going to have uh, Professor uh, Hank Chambers uh, from the University of Richmond Lab Law School. And we're going to talk about, again, a topic I don't know that we can contain it within an hour, and that is the current discussion on, uh, uh, let's see, critical race theory, uh, the 1619 Project, education, and the First Amendment. So I'm looking forward to that uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, until uh, next time, peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bye.